What would lead a first century rabbi to travel thousands of miles by sea and by land, to be beaten, imprisoned, and ultimately beheaded for his faith? It was a call, a call to turn the world upside down. This is the story of the Apostle Paul, whose writings continue to shape the lives of one third of the world's population, a man second only to Jesus in his impact and influence on the Christian faith, and whose witness defines what it means to be a follower of Jesus Christ. No other human being aside from Jesus himself has had a greater impact on the world or on the Christian faith than the Apostle Paul. The Apostle Paul in his conversion experience encountering Christ was radically changed. And then he spent the rest of his life reflecting on the meaning of Jesus' life, death, and resurrection, starting churches across the Roman Empire, writing letters to those churches so that in the end, 13 of the 21 New Testament epistles were written by him. His faith and his reflections on the meaning of Christ are what shaped and laid the foundation for the Christian faith and for Christian theology, which continues to shape our faith, Christianity's faith, to the present time. And over the next few weeks, we're going to retrace the story, the life, the message, the ministry of the Apostle Paul in the very places where he walked, in the places where he taught, in the places where he started churches. I'm excited to take you on this journey with me as we explore the life, the message, the ministry of the Apostle Paul. So, Let's begin. The story of the Apostle Paul begins in what is today Southeast Turkey, but what was at the time Southeast Asia Minor, in a city called Tarsus, which was the capital city of the Roman province of Cilicia. Paul's hometown of Tarsus was nestled between the Mediterranean Sea and the Taurus Mountains. If you were to visit there, you'd find that there's just one small stretch of road, Roman road from Paul's era that's been excavated. Most of the Roman city is underneath the current modern city of Tarsus. And then there is a mountain pass that the highway passes through today. Paul would have passed through in his day, very famous on either side. The mountains have been cut away. This is called the Cilician Gates. And Paul would have passed through these gates on his way up to central Turkey or central Asia Minor on his second missionary journey. There is a well there that's called St. Paul's Well. Was it his well? Who knows? But it certainly does anchor the story and remind us that Paul grew up in this place. And it was there that he was raised in a devoted Jewish home. His name, given by his parents, was a Jewish name, Saul, named after the first king of Israel. But he was also, his family were also Roman citizens, and so he had a Roman name. His Roman name was Paul. He would have been trained in, in both the Roman schools, uh, in the Greco-Roman schools, and so he was familiar with Greek thought. He was familiar with the Greek language. Of course, it was his native language, probably. And, uh, and it was here that he learned the Greek philosophers. At the same time, his family was very devoted in their faith and their desire to follow God. And as a young man, he was sent to Jerusalem to study under the finest of the rabbis of the time, a man named Gamaliel. And it was there that he was trained in the, in the uh, law and in the prophets, in the writings, in the oral traditions of his people, and in the oral law that had been passed on from generation to generation. He was deeply devoted to God, zealous for the law, and he was trained in the school of the Pharisees, so that he described himself as a Pharisee of Pharisees, and as pertaining to the law, as blameless as one could be. This was the Apostle Paul, one foot in two worlds. Now, Paul writes of his own life and of his faith, before he'd come to faith in Christ, in these words in Philippians chapter 3. He says, I was circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, in regard to the law, a Pharisee, as for zeal, persecuting the church, as for legalistic righteousness, faultless. It's likely that Paul was in Jerusalem on that Passover when Jesus was crucified, though there's no evidence that Paul was there actually watching this take place. But we know that shortly after that, after the disciples began to proclaim that Jesus was raised from the dead, after they said that he was in fact the living Lord and the Messiah and the King of the Jews, that Jewish leadership began to try to figure out how to deal with these followers of Jesus. And, and as they did, Saul, Paul, volunteered to be a part of squelching this new movement. And so he began harassing these Christians and, and, uh, and, and stood by, we read in Acts chapter 7, he stood by 
as Stephen was stoned to death, one of the leaders of the Christian movement, the early leaders of the Christian movement, stood by as he was stoned to death. And in Acts chapter 8, verse 1, we read that he stood by giving approval as the first Christian martyr after Jesus was put to death. And, and so it was as he was uh, leading this charge that, that he was determined to, uh, to arrest and to, um, and to really wage a battle against these early Christians, believing that they were false teachers and wanting to demonstrate to those in Jerusalem his devotion to the faith, he begins arresting Christians. He begins throwing them in jail, both men and women. And it was at this time that he received letters from the high priest to go to Damascus in Syria and to search the synagogues there for those followers of Jesus who had made their way to Damascus in order to arrest them and bring them back to Jerusalem. As he's on his way, he's on a stretch of Roman road, not unlike this stretch of Roman road here, and suddenly there is a blinding light. He's knocked to his knees and, and he hears a voice, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he cries out, who are you? And he says, I'm Jesus whom you're persecuting. And Jesus then and there calls him, calls him to be his follower. And, and he tells him to go on into the city of Damascus and there, that, there he'll find a place to stay. And, and then there will be a man named Ananias who will come and find Saul and tell him what to do. And so he's taken to the city of Damascus. He's blind for three days. For three days, he's left without the ability to see. He doesn't eat, he doesn't drink, he just prays during that period of time. Everything he thinks he knows has been taken away from him. He, he's been brought to his knees, not just physically, but emotionally, psychologically, and spiritually. And now he's ready, he's right where God needs him to be in order for him to answer the call. And now there's Ananias, who is a believer in, in the city of Damascus, and he's aware of who Saul is. In fact, he's afraid of Saul. So are the believers there, because Saul is coming to arrest them. And the Holy Spirit speaks to Ananias and says, Ananias, I need you to go find a man named Saul. And he tells him where to find him. And he says, I need you to share with him the good news. And so Ananias works up the courage to find the man who'd been persecuted, and even stood by at the death of one of the followers of Jesus in Jerusalem. He goes to find this man, Saul. He explains to him the gospel. And on that very day, Saul is baptized blind. He's baptized as he yields his life completely to Christ. And as he comes out of that water, it's like scales falling off of his eyes. And suddenly, the one who was lost has been found. The one who was blind can now see. After Saul's conversion, he says that he went off into the, into the Arabian desert and it was there. He, uh, he spent time praying and thinking and trying to understand and make sense of his, of his newfound faith and experience. And, and I'm reminded of the fact that the definition often given to the word theology is faith seeking understanding. He had this faith that he'd now experienced and had and placed in Jesus Christ, but he had to make sense of this. Uh, he comes back to Damascus and he spends three years in Damascus and there he's preaching and ministering and with real boldness he's converting people and drawing people to Jesus Christ and, and this unnerves the Jewish leadership there that the man who once had been the persecutor of the church is now leading Jews and Gentiles to faith in Jesus and ultimately at the end of three years he's, uh, he's forced to flee because some there want to kill him. He, he spends two weeks in Jerusalem with the Apostle Peter and also with James, the brother of the Lord. And they're undoubtedly listening to the stories firsthand from these witnesses to Jesus Christ. And then he goes back to Tarsus, his hometown in Cilicia. And in Tarsus, he spends years in Tarsus in the area around there, preaching and teaching and, and also tent making, providing a living for himself. 14 years after the time of his conversion, Barnabas is sent to find Paul in Tarsus and brings him back to Syrian Antioch. Antioch continues to be a huge and vibrant city to the present day. The Orontes River runs right through the middle of the city. In Paul's day, the city was built on one bank of the Orontes River, and it's known as Antioch on the Orontes because of this river, differentiating it from the many other cities called Antioch throughout Asia Minor and this part of the world. Now, one of the only ancient sites in the city today is uh, from perhaps the first or second centuries, uh, probably much later, is a cave church. This is called the Cave Church of St. Peter. And the tradition was that St. Peter carved out this cave and uh, expanded this cave, and it became the first place of Christian worship in the city of Antioch as, uh, as Paul and the Gentiles and, and the Jews that were there who were followers of Jesus were worshiping together. And so the believers lay their hands on Paul and Barnabas, and they send them out on their first official missionary journey. 
As we bring this session to a close, there were two things I wanted to really focus on. The first had to do with Ananias. I think about Ananias and I think about the courage it took for him. First of all, his willingness to listen for the voice of the Holy Spirit saying, Ananias, go and find this man Saul. And so one of the questions I would ask of us, of me and of you, is are you listening and paying attention to the voice of the Spirit? Because you see, God calls all of us. God called Ananias at that moment to do something that took courage and boldness, to go to a man who had been arresting Christians and offer him life. And, and for all he knew, I mean, he had to trust that God was going to be with him, that God was calling him, that, that, uh, that he wasn't going to be arrested by Saul or persecuted or even put to death as Saul had done with Stephen. Ananias had courage. And when God called him, he said yes. And I wonder, who are the people? I mean, if Ananias could do this, who are the people that God might be calling you to share your faith with, calling you to help open the eyes of another person who's spiritually blind? And as that happened, you know, Ananias is nowhere else mentioned in the Bible. We don't read about him again. But the impact that he had in that one place where he was faithful, that one time where he said yes and he went and he shared the good news, changed the world. But the second thing I want us to notice as we close this session, the Apostle Paul yielded his life wholly to Christ. That was the beginning of his Christian life when he finally said, here I am, Lord. Everything I am, everything I have, everything I thought I knew, every dream I ever had, I turn it over to you. And I invite you to make that your prayer today. Like the Apostle Paul, to accept Jesus Christ, to put your trust in him, and to yield everything you are and everything you have to him. And you begin that journey that Paul began of changing the world.